Hello, everyone, and welcome to Let's Talk Scuba. And we've got one person joining the uh, live stream already. That's that's really good. Um, I don't know who it is at the moment, but just put up any comments that you want. Any questions, we'll deal with them as we go along. Generally, we deal with all the comments, and uh, you know, unless they're extremely personal, rude, or you know, not allowed on YouTube, then then I don't show them. But that's obvious. Today, I've got my first Paddy course director interview. You know, the highest of the high, the mightiest of the mightiest, the Paddy course director. And I've not just got any, any course director people. I've got a platinum course, course director for you all. So, yeah, um, let's see. I mean, um, if any other course directors want to come on the show who watch this, yeah, I'll, I'll talk to you. Um, Right, who have we got today? We've got Tim Bradley. Oh, Critter Hunter has arrived. He's on. He's in the stream. Oh, poor old Tim, because we are now going to get the Critter Hunter I want to take over your show um, thing. Anyway, we've got Tim Bradley. He's a Platinum Course Director. Um, we're going to talk to him, not about Paddy and stuff, well, a little bit as we go on, um, but we're going to talk you know, how he got into scuba diving, and what drove him to become you know, one of Paddy's highest rated um, course directors? Does he still have the passion? All that stuff. But just put your questions up. Um, he's from Chicago, believe it or not. Now, when I first saw Tim online and stuff through his um, Sea Explorers YouTube channel, I would, have, I would have bet money he was a typical Californian. But he's not. He's from the cold, I guess it's Midwest and the windy city of Chicago. He is currently the head of instruction for the Sea Explorers chain of dive resorts in the Philippines, um, which has, I think, been in existence since about 1989. And they've got centers all over the Philippines, so they must know what they're doing if they've been around that long. Um, hopefully, one day I might get the owner of um, Sea Explorers and Pura Vida on the show. Let's see. If he likes what I've done with Tim, he may agree. Um, from what I understand, Tim was a relatively late entrant into the scuba diving profession. And by that, I mean a lot of people who want to become dive instructors will start from 18, 19, 20, you know, do their rite of passage as a dive slave and all of that. And they've got a pretty good idea. But um, Tim had a pretty interesting background before he actually made the decision to go into um, scuba diving. Of course, then he would have had to play catch up because becoming a... Um, course director is by invitation and it's a competitive process we'll talk about that so without further ado let's get um tim on on the show that's enough from me welcome tim how are you hello brian i am doing fantastic and there's me in my little man cave and studio and where are you because it looks much better than where i am uh, i was out this morning in dubai and summer has officially arrived it was sticky but dogs tired i'm tired just for walking 40 minutes it's the same yesterday but it looks it's much little, nicer where you are yeah it's a little warm here where i am also um i don't know if you could see that behind me or not i am at the beach bar at pura Vida, oh, right man. next to my office at sea explorers right oh man um, I've just put my boat back in the water, but yeah, we'll be on it tomorrow. But I'd still rather be there. I'd still rather be there on the beach with you guys. <laughs> Looks great because it's going to be hot and sticky for three, four months now. So, yes, I am envious officially. So, Tim, um, <laughs> I'd like to start off with the kind of first question. And I do this with most people. I just Can you just um, tell us about yourself, um, where you grew up? Um, did you go to college? What did you do before becoming a dive professional? And how did you get interested in becoming a dive professional? So if you can give us that bit of background, and then we'll get into the really meaty stuff. Well, sure. So, um, you know, I've always, I've been kind of a wanderer, as how I like to say it. Um, finishing up with high school, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with my life. And I spent actually a good portion of my 20s traveling around in uh, bands, 
touring in the United States, uh, just doing some things like that, odds and ends when I wasn't doing that, some odd jobs, uh, doing some construction, and just little things like that. After a while of that, I thought maybe I should go back to college and learn to do something proper with my life. Uh, being from Chicago, I was always fascinated with architecture. Uh, Chicago is a fantastic architectural city. Uh, so I went to the Art Institute and I got a degree in design there and started working in that field and decided I didn't like it. <laughs> and that was right around the time I discovered diving. Yeah, I love right. studying it. I love studying architecture and all of that, um, but I did not enjoy being in a cubicle after I had spent my 20s wandering around the country. Um, now, tell us about the band. band. What sort of band was it? Oh, uh, played in several bands, uh, rock and roll, blues bands, things like that. Um, yeah, just traveling around the Midwest and uh, other parts of the countries, both coasts, and, uh, you know, just enjoying life a little bit um yeah you know it's uh it's um, it's you, fun but it's uh, did, it's, it's also not instrument? easy sorry uh, i could play bass and sing i play bass, play bass and sing so you're in the ideal country now you're in the so, Philippines, uh, right? yeah uh that's karaoke that's a different kind of singing <laughs> but do you still play the guitar and sing <laughs> Not very often. Um, I kind of I put that aside when I was getting involved in diving and never really picked it back up seriously. Um, All right. So I did how plenty old, of it during my twenties. Uh, enough for enough you, for a lifetime. Yeah. How old were you when when you graduated from the art institute then? Oh, let's see. That would have been. I was. I was already thirty years old. Right. So yeah. So that's yeah. So, so you were. Um, so when did when did you where did you actually make your first late, dive? That was in yeah, Chicago. Could, um, it, right. I was gonna get certified. Um, it was. It, I was going to go on a trip to Jamaica. And I was going to get certified before then. And we started diving there um, at a local dive center in Chicago and did a course there uh, with a guy named uh, Brian, actually. Uh, great name, right? Yeah, yeah, right. And uh, it, was, uh, it, it was a really, really great open water course, um, even the the diving in Chicago, I really enjoyed that, even though it's kind of a, a cold and muddy lake that we used for training. Um, I so just can really, we hold really, it there? Really got, right away got, fell in love with that. We've got Justin on the line. We've got Justin on the line. Hold on. Let's just see nope. what he's up to. Justin. Yeah. Oh, yeah, look, I'm live streaming. Someone's left. Yeah, go and get it. All right. <laughs> I thought that was um, Judea. I couldn't see the phone. I thought, oh, Judea, because I must be doing something wrong on the live stream. Ah. I better answer it. It wasn't. It was my friend Yulik who's left his phone on the. <laughs> Sorry about that, people. But it is live now. You know it's live. It's not. <laughs> it's not practice. Anyway, talking to Credanta, I thought my mic wasn't working or something. He was just ringing up to say. Um, you know, Brian, you're doing this wrong. So let's have, he's been on, ask Tim how the cuttlefish eggs are. Is this kind of private joke? Is it some disease or something? Uh, yes, uh, we, have some, we have some cuttlefish eggs nearby and I have been checking them so often, hoping to get some video of them hatching. Justin has been saying they're going to think I am their mother when they're born. <laughs> cool that'd be nice to see that um because you've only got a small isn't it that on a full moon or something they they hatch um you know there's surprisingly little research about that 
uh, done in the wild. Uh, there's some stuff that you can find about, about in uh, some studies that they've done, like the Monterey Aquarium and some places like that. Um, we're guessing it's between 18 and 24 days of station for the eggs, uh, according to what the basic research is. But again, that's aquarium research, not, not in the wild research. So I discovered them about, about 10 days ago. Um, and they're, they're just starting to look like little cuttlefish inside of them. Uh, they're almost transparent. So once they get their colors, they're actually flamboyant colors, we'll know they're almost ready to hatch. And then I'll be down there all day, every day, trying to That's actually it. get some What you need to do is have a shift of you, Finn, the dive masters, one in, one out, one in for, you know, for 24 hours. That would be a cool sort of live event, wouldn't it? Just people going in with one diver yeah, in, one yeah. diver that, there you go, Critter Hunter. He's still on. He's, he's yeah, um, and I mean, we'll see. An idea for you. Like, once again, you know, I come up with all the ideas for him. Anyway, he's here. He reckons you've got a mini karaoke machine in your car in case of emergency. <laughs> I tell you, he's just going to bomb us with these sorts of uh, comments. So, yeah, no. Just get ready. <laughs> and that was just, when I just said he was calling, he was, I was like, no, I'm not calling. No, it wasn't. It was my mate, Ulick. And he was calling from his wife's phone. She's called Julia. And Julia. And, yeah, I'm not great with the eyesight anymore. So, anyway, um, let's get back. If we've got five uh, people yeah. on, on now, um, thank you for joining the live stream. Please put comments or questions up. Um, virtually anything goes, as long as it doesn't embarrass somebody or it's rude or whatever, or it's not about scuba diving. It's called Let's, let's Talk Scuba, right? So... Tim isn't going to tell us where the best bars in Darwin are on this show. Well, he might. I've not been there yet, so I might need to know that. Right. So, <laughs> so you made your first dive in Chicago. You learned to dive in Chicago. Where was it? Was it in a lake or was it in was it uh, Chicago borders? Is it? Yeah, lake? it was. It, lake, it was a lake. Which lake? I've been there. It was actually One of the great lakes, no, right? not the not the Great Lakes. I actually did my first dive. In a first dive in Oking Lake, it's called Pearl Lake. It's actually uh, northwestern Illinois, uh, near Wisconsin. Uh, it is, they do have an area that's dedicated for diving with some uh, some wrecks, some purpose sumper wrecks and things like that down there. Um, one of their claim to fame is they have the actual stage prop uh, Gilligan's boat from the TV show Gilligan's Island is sunk in that lake. Yeah, yeah. So, right, uh, was it, was, was, how cold you know, was it? A little piece of television memorabilia down there. How cold was it? Uh, when I, for my first dive, I think, oh, I'm going to talk in Fahrenheit, though. It would have been about 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, so down in the low teens centigrade, right? So, was that wet suit, dry suit? Yeah. Were you in a wetsuit or dry uh, suit? Learning it was a wetsuit. Uh, I wetsuit when I was learning how. Uh, I very quickly transitioned to dry suit. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, it's just like in England. Um, yeah. So he's done cold, cold water diving, Critter Hunter. You know, he'll take you there one day. Right. So you learned in Chicago because <laughs> you were going off to Jamaica. You wanted to dive. I assume that all, all went well. When did you make the decision, this is for me, I want to become a dive professional? And how long after that sort of first dive did it take for you to become an open water instructor in Aussie? So, um, two years. I learned in Rule 4 and became an instructor in 2000. Uh, so, it was pretty quick. Um, and I was just diving as much as possible, diving locally going on dive trips uh, to the Caribbean, to Fiji, uh, wh wherever I could land myself that was supposed to have great diving, I was working on uh, checking it off a giant worldwide list. And uh, I really found out early on that I, I loved sharing diving, um, like talking about it, showing pictures of it, uh, things like that. And one of the best ways I found to share diving with people was to 
teach them about it. So I did my dive master course with my eye on instructor. And this is all done in Chicago. Uh, it was snowing during my IE. Um, oh. But uh, it was fantastic. And yeah. All right. Um, Tridan just told us, told me there's a delay. So I'm holding back a bit and letting you finish and waiting a couple of microseconds before I, I answer um, and go on to the next question. So, I mean, that's pretty good. But you were, okay. you were in you were intense two years really going at it and becoming and to become an open water instructor at that point did you decide i want to go to become a course director or did that kind of develop later it was always in the back of my mind um you know as a, a goal i had set for myself but it didn't actually actually develop until till many years later when I was actually headed to the Philippines um, that that was when I, I crossed that final line and, and became a course director right so that final finish line yeah um, so you worked in Chicago did you did you stay in the same dive shop all the time or did you um, switch dive shops to get faster up the ladder so to speak No, once I started working in diving, um, it was all with the same dive center in Chicago. There, a place called Four City Scuba uh, that was out west of Chicago, um, and we had a really good training program. Um, I was pretty much running the dive center. Uh, the owner had moved down to St. Croix and was letting me have at it. He had had enough of the cold weather. Uh, so since I'd pretty well with the customers and pretty well with the travel program and things like that, he let me take it over and I was running it with him watching from afar. Um, and we did, and like I said, we were doing very good with training well, and with the travel. And was that where you actually learned to dive? Was it the same center? What's that? Was that the same center you learned? No, you it was a open? different dive center. Um, no, it was a it was a different one. Um, the uh, uh, that one, the instructors that I learned from have kind of moved over to this one, and uh, I I followed along with them. Um, All right, okay. So, you, and, and that's what yeah, when eventually people... ended up taking it over. Yeah. So that I mean that and that's I mean that's you just made a good point yeah. there, and because you see online all the time, you know, which agency should I do my course? with it as, as an open water diver. Um, and I always reply, you know, look for the instructor first, get an instructor recommendation. And for your open water, it doesn't really matter which agency you do it with. What you want is quality of instruction. And that's exactly what you did. You followed the instructor to the other, to the other center. Right. And, uh, you know, as far as that point goes, I, I would agree with you 100%. Um, I've had the benefit throughout my entire diving career of working with some very good and some very poor instructors. Um, I learned a lot from the very poor instructors too. Uh, some of that was what not to do. But, you know, it's, it's really, it's about the individual and their attitude towards instructing and what they want to offer their divers, their clients, their customers. It's not about uh, an agency affiliation. It's it's about the person. So, for, how long did it actually take you from uh, becoming an open water scuba instructor, as we call an hourly in the trade, to actually qualifying as a course director? Eight years. Eight years. And that, yeah, because you've got a lot of, there's a lot of pre-qualification to do, isn't there? You've got to be a master instructor, and then you have to have a wide range of certifications throughout the PADI program. Um, so, eight years, so Correct. you mentioned... In addition to... Sorry, Tim. 
Well, I was going to say, uh, yeah, in addition to all the certifications and ranks, you also have to assist with a number of IDCs uh, to qualify for course director training also. Okay. Um, and I understand that course director is by, is it by invitation only or do you, you have to apply and then they, they select who can go on that year's course director course? Uh, what's the process? So you, there is an application, uh, and once you apply, they kind of go through and, and decide who's getting in that year. It is a competitive process. Uh, so uh, it was, I think, the year I did it, they were doing two course director training courses, and it's either 35 or 40 people are allowed into each one. So about 80 a year. Uh, and, you know, they explain that number is based on a little bit on how many they think will be retiring versus the growth of the industry and things like that. Um, All right. So, so it, it is competitive. And it, yeah, so my application was 62 pages long and contained a full business plan uh, about how I intended to run IDCs and how I'm going to get people to them. It's it's a. Uh, it's a, it's a process. Right. So yeah, it's not easy. Um, and you, you don't have to answer this question if you don't want to. What does a course director training course cost? And if you don't want to answer, it's fine. Um, I, I don't know if I say an exact number, but it's a lot. Um, but to sure. maybe be ballpark it, I would say about 20 times the average open water course. Wow. Um, okay. All right. That's good enough. That's good. So it's, you know, it's going to be around eight to ten thousand dollars okay. or something. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's the kind of number Somewhere I had in that neighborhood. Yeah. In addition to the all the all the extras. Right. Right. We get it. I'm not I'm not going to embarrass you. We'll, we'll move on from that. Now you did mention earlier. Um, that you know, one of the drivers um, for you to qualify as a course director is because you made the decision to come to Philippines or you were thinking about it. What, what was that all about? So, you know, I, at some point I just kind of got tired a little bit of life in general in the States and was doing a lot of Work and die and thinking they are I someplace where there's beautiful warm waters, nice beaches, amazing tropical diving. Um, you know, kind of thinking, let's I, I've paid my dues here. Let's go someplace where I can do the other part of diving uh, and in, enjoy the setting a little bit more. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll go back to about. about the Midwest, but why did you choose Philippines? I mean, there's lots of good places. Indonesia, right? That's an, another diving hot spot. There's Australia. There's lots of good. Why the Philippines? You know, as I was traveling around those last couple of years, uh, I started looking at every place that I would go to, thinking, "Well, what about this place? Is this where I could settle down?" And there was always one or two things that just didn't feel right. Um, you know, for some of them, it was as simple as, uh, wow, the pizza here is crappy in this country. <laughs> um, you know, some things the felt like that. And then the, well, I mean, you know, being from Chicago, you got to have pizza. Um, so... I came to the Philippines the first time. It was actually here, my, my first place that I went to was right here in Pura Vida. And it, it, about the third day here, I thought, this is it. Like, this is it. It just uh, pinged my inner tuning fork. And uh, I had a text message all set to go back home to my mom that said, send dog, sell shit. Um, but I thought, no, no, I should actually, actually return and uh, 
and take care of packing up by myself. So uh, yeah. after that, though, I kind of started checking out other parts of the Philippines and seeing if if it was all amazing, if it wouldn't matter where I ended up. Um, and, you know, I, I count myself very fortunate that it always came back to Darwin as my favorite place. And that just happened to be where I landed. All right. So yeah, it wasn't an impulsive move then. You've been traveling with diving, taking people on holidays and stuff. And then you found the spot. Yeah. Um, and I mean, it was a combination of you know, the, the most amazing people, uh, for me, I'll say my favorite diving, uh, saying the best diving is kind of subjective and is going to start, uh, people arguing. So I'll just say well, my so favorite personal. diving that yeah. I've ever run across. Yeah. yeah it, it, it's like here in Dubai, you, you see online, oh, there's no diving in Dubai or it's, it's rubbish and all of that. But just look at some of my YouTube videos, right? We have some really nice diving in Dubai. Yes, we can have bad vis, we can have some strong currents, but mm -hmm. and it's good, it's fantastic, you know, but it, you can't do it every day. Um, look, old Critter Hunter, he does make yeah. me laugh. So he's now thinks that a course director course is $60,000. Critter Hunter, it isn't, it's much less than that, but we're not going over that again. But you would buy a Jolly yes, B much franchise much for that. that. Yeah, well, he would buy a Jolly Bee franchise. You know. <laughs> Justin, you've obviously studied it. We're a bit worried. Is the channel not doing very well? <laughs> David Streets, come on. He's the owner of Dive Systems International. <laughs> and he's an inventor, and he invented the Proteus All right. um, rebreather, um, which he originally developed oh, as a bailout rebreather for side mount, the side mount rebreather for bailout. So you could go on a rebreather and then um, have a bailout rebreather re as well instead of carrying all, all those cylinders. So good morning, David. Thanks for joining. Right, let's just get back on track. Of it. Ah, one good question. You brought the pizza up. Pineapple on pizza, yes or no? Okay. No. No. There you go. Not it. allowed. From the Chicagoan or whatever you call people from Chicago, no. Um, it's a bit hot top, topic at the moment. I don't people get into it. I'll even get into it now. Right. Um, can you give the viewers um, a bit of an idea of what it's like you know, running a, a dive centre in, in the Midwest, in Chicago, and how the divers actually go diving? You know, how, how do they... I mean, you, you said for, you know, for two years you were diving every, every opportunity you got. So you were in Chicago. Um, just give people an insight on... You know, if they learn to dive in Chicago and they want um, to do a lot of diving, what would they do? And what was it like running a dive operation there, particularly with those winters that you get? Well, um, you know, the the dive operation there is a little bit it's a little bit different than when you're in a vacation destination. You know, one of the things we did was because so many people they wouldn't want to go in a cold, dark muddy lake um, we offered them to do just the classroom and pool portion of the course with us and then give them a referral that they could take to the nice warm caribbean um, you know we always tried to build a good community feeling at the dive center and do events that were sometimes almost based as much on socializing as on diving um, you know where we would go out to the training lake and and we would do uh you know, barbecues there and plan something for afterwards. Uh, we ran events at the pool that we would rent. Uh, like during Olympics time, we would do underwater Olympics at the pool, things like that, you know, based on uh, being social and developing a, a, like a dive community there. Because, you know, people so that are involved. into diving, they, they love to dive. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, oh, yeah there's much. a lot more to it than just uh, hey let's 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 go look at some fish and coral. Uh, you know you have to yeah, you have well, to put in a little bit more labor. Um, uh... Yeah, a bit like I, I learned with the British Tobacco Club, and and that, although they're not, they're amateurs, but again it was that sense of community, um, time being spent with each other and honing skills. So yeah, so I guess that's in many ways, a similar sort of experience. 
Yeah, and I mean, part of what we were doing too was looking for a way to fill out the the winter months. Uh, not not everyone, even the hardcore divers, not everyone loves ice diving. So yeah. you're looking for ways to fill that time with different kinds of training, and that was how I kind of got involved in some of the public safety diving training. Which ah, which is my next question. So ah. I. From doing my research and looking online and that, uh, I understood that you were very big in public safety diving. And I think you became one of the few non-military or non-police qualified underwater CSIs, crime scene investigators. Um, how did that happen and what's involved in being an underwater investigator? So as I, as I developed with public safety diving more and more uh you know that's a that's a particular kind of niche in diving and it it is usually quite dangerous uh and somewhat stressful especially if you're looking for a drowning victim there's usually a reason that someone drowned in that waterway uh strong currents horrible disability bad conditions things like that uh, so to go into that environment, you're, you're risking a lot. Uh, so as someone who believes in training, I started seeking out better and better training. And eventually that led me to uh, the guy, his name is Mike Berry. He runs uh, uh, a program called UCI. He's one of the most experienced public safety divers in the States. He actually wrote Patty's public safety diver materials and i ended up with an invitation to an underwater criminal investigator course that he was operating and there were no other civilians on that course at that time uh lots of their dive professionals but all of them had some kind of law enforcement and affiliation um, but because i had done so much training actual diving it was subcontracting with a lot of local municipalities to help with their public safety teams and things like that um, i got invited to do this course and it was absolutely fantastic training and uh, definitely helped prepare me for some of what was to come wow. that, that's interesting um that's just what's the decision to quit chicago and move overseas was that a really big decision or you just thought about it over time and were just waiting for the right place or you know was it did you have to really think long and hard about it and say it, is this for me it, it was a big it was a big decision um you know i had worked worked very hard at the dive center i was at to set up these training programs and travel programs um, I had really kind of ingrained myself into the community with some of this public safety diving, um, and my family is there. So yeah, it was a big decision, but uh, you know, it was time. Uh, I think the finite amount of that public safety diving that anyone can do, um, and it's going to be different for everybody who gets involved in it. But I felt like I was reaching the end of my time doing that. And I was just ready to try something different. Uh, and, you know, like I said before, kind of you know, felt like I paid my dues a little bit. Now let's, um, let's move to the more recreational side of diving. All right. Okay. So no regrets. No, none at all. Um, I, I have never been as happy as I am over here uh, with what I'm doing. Uh, it, every morning, I am so excited to get up for work. Uh, it's just fantastic. All right, let's go through a few comments. Um, Grenada, yeah, fit. Okay. Massively's Wi-Fi. Yeah, well, a lot of countries, it's not great. Um, we've had the Jolly Bee. We've had David. Grenada's back. Um, will your name your what we you, what will you name your cuttle children? Will they follow you on all dives? <laughs> uh, um, so oh. they're going to be Huey, Dewey, Louie, and Justin. 
and ah. they will come with me on all my decks. Right, there you go. Um, and Crit Andy's going to ask about other courses. Yeah, we're going to cover that later in the interview. That's on my list of questions, Justin. Right, where are we? Yeah, okay, so um, you worked virtually just at the, the one centre in the US in, in Chicago. You've been at Sea Explorers now. How long have you been at Sea Explorers? And um, was that the first place you worked in, in the Philippines? Seven years. Um, seven years? Yes. And I've been here. Yeah, seven years. And is that the only center you've worked at in the Philippines? Yes, the only uh, operator I, I've gone and worked at all the different sea explorers, but I've only worked in the Philippines with sea explorers. Okay. Um, can you give us an overview um, of sea explorers? It'd be nice to know where they're based besides Dowing. Uh, so an overview of the sea explorers operation and your actually role in the organization and the connection between Pura Vida and sea explorers. All right, so uh, Sea Explorers was started, like you said before, in 1989. And when they first started, they worked with a few different kinds of operations, uh, doing dive safaris and also inside of a few existing resorts. And then eventually, uh, the, the founder of Sea Explorers decided why not have his own resorts, and that's the Pura Vida uh, resorts. So it's, uh, we are not the same company, but the same family with Pura Vida. Uh, they're both, they're both run by the same guy whose name is Chris. Um, we have right now we have locations here in Dawin in the Philippines, which is near Dumaguete. We have one in Malapasqua, one in Cabalao and one on uh, Alo Beach which is in Panglao on the island of Bohol. We also will have one opening in Sipilai, which is on the other side of Negros, the island I'm on now. If not for the pandemic, it would probably already be open, but that's kind of slowed down some of those uh, expansion ideas. Pretty soon we're gonna have five. And then we also have a head office that's in Cebu City that takes care of uh, logistics and things like that for the whole coming. All right. So it's quite what a substantial right? is besides being Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, what I do besides being the course director here at the Dowling location is I'm the head instruction for the company, which means a few times a year I go to all the different locations and I audit courses that are going on while I'm there. So I sit in on an existing course with an instructor and their students. Um, the, the students meet me and they know what I'm doing there. And I'm just basically sitting in to see how it's going. Um, see if there are any tips I can give those instructors, any questions I can answer. And just make sure the students, our guests, are getting the best possible experience with their courses. And then I do the same thing with the dives too, with fun dives. Uh, I do that with the dive masters, make sure they're giving uh, top-notch briefings and just that the guests are really getting what uh, the, the very best of what the dive industry has to offer. So, so in many ways you're like a mentor for all the dive professionals within the company. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's how I like to look at it. You know, I think when I've, when I first started doing this position, I think people were afraid I was some kind of like secret police force or something that was uh, looking to punish them or write them, write them nasty notes for how they were teaching. And, and that's not it. It's never been uh, supposed to be a punitive type of arrangement. It's supposed to be a mentoring uh, teaching process uh, for our, our guys so that when they're done with their with their courses, our clients go forth into the world and tell everyone they had an amazing experience here. And we all benefit from that, from the clients all the way down to the employees here. Right, great. Um, I, I, that was another question. I, I, I missed it. I meant to ask it earlier on because you're a platinum course director, right? So 
can you let people um, know yes. what a platinum course director is? And for me, um, and it's a bit of a loaded question, you know, what's in it for the, di the di instructor candidate um, by using a, going with a platinum um, course director um, rather than just, a, I guess, the silver and bronze? You know, are there any real benefits to the instructor candidates by having a platinum course director do their IDC? Well, the, the platinum level is is for the most experienced course directors, uh, the people that are doing the highest volume of training. Um, not to say that what we have here is an instructor factory. Uh, on the contrary, I, I keep my course size very small. Uh, the, the largest IDC I will do is eight people at a time. Um, I, I am not an instructor factory. Um, but just over time, I've, I've achieved a high level of dive professional training. And so what that means to the candidates that would come and see a platinum course director is not only are you getting a more experienced course director, but to achieve that requires a, a very high level of personal dedication to the training and to your candidates and just to making sure that uh, not just that you're teaching the most amount of people, but that you're offering the best courses. Because if you weren't offering the best courses, people would hear about that, and you wouldn't be teaching very many people their IDCs. Yeah, but so on the other to answer hand, your question about what's the benefit to the candidates, it's just uh, you know you're you're going to see someone who's dedicated themselves. To, to professional training. Yeah, but I mean, surely all course directors, whatever level, must have dedicated themselves to professional training, right? That's what I don't get. Um, yes and no. Um, you know, I know sometimes that um, people do that with their eye on a job at Patty headquarters. Um, the course director level is required for certain jobs at Patty headquarters. And I also know, I mean, there are a few guys that were in, in my training course that don't actually do very many IDCs. Um, the, they became course director and maybe they intended to do lots of IDCs, but, uh, maybe because they're running a dive center, the day-to-day -day operations take up a lot more, um, a lot more of their time, or they spend more time on other training, or, um, you know, they just do another aspect of diving. To, to get to that platinum level, you're doing IDC training, and that's your main focus. IDC or, or dive professional training, dive masters also. Yeah, but I, I did my IDC staff with a guy called Gary Marsden, and I, um, I was just looking at the Undersea Journal and at the list of um, the course directors there, I was checking out that you really were a platinum course director, and you are. Um, and then my, my friend Gary Marsden, who's been he's been doing IDCs, I think now for at least thirty years. He's just um, I think finished one in Malta. But he's just down there at bronze, and that's what his main job is. But I think he keeps his um, IDCs very, very small, but he's active all the time. And for me, um, having because he used to, when I owned dive centers in Dubai, he was one of our course directors who would come out and do IDCs. And he was exceptional. But, you know, mm -hmm. the message I'm getting, because he's not putting volume through and he's focusing on quality, it could be perceived, because he's not platinum, that he's not very good when I know differently. And, you know, that's the, that's the problem with an award system um, is that, yeah, so someone recently asked me, it was a, a recent graduate of an IDC, why would anyone come to me? It's going to take me time before I can become an elite instructor, before I can... You know, basically going through looking at the different awards. And I, I said to him, well, it's, it, of course that that has 
a little bit to do with it, but it's it's your own your own self that's going to make you a good instructor and it's going to help grow the word about how great you are out there. Just because you don't have an Elite 100 award stamp or something like that doesn't mean that you're not a good instructor. Uh, so it's, you know, there are good instructors, bad instructors, like I said before. Um, there are probably some people with very high levels that I would consider not so good or not so passionate about what they're doing, uh, but they've managed to achieve that award. I think in general, though, um, to do that, you're really, you're really dedicating yourself to only that, that and then also to um, a little bit to working with a, a large group of people, a uh, large number. Of okay, people. right. We'll get off that, that sticky subject. <laughs> but thanks for, thanks for answering that brutally, honestly, for me. Appreciated that. Um, Critter Hunter's got a serious question. I don't believe it. Um, did you ever fire a bad dive master or instructor? Ooh, um, me personally. So here in the Philippines, that is uh, not my job. Uh, I am not the human resources manager for CXO. Okay, well, let's take we recommend so somebody my, not who my job. Um, you know, I, I would recommend retraining before termination. Uh, it would have to be, it, there would have to be something very egregious going on where I would, where I would say someone would have to be terminated for something. Um, you know, sometimes it's more of an attitude question or here in the Philippines, what I found with Sometimes the foreign staff is, they just can't get along with uh, the local crew here. Uh, and that, that sometimes makes it difficult. People pose the question to me, um, do, do you think this person is salvageable? Uh, and if the answer is no, then I'm honest about it. Okay. So I mean, so, the takeaway. No, I don't if personally handle the hiring and firing. Yeah, but the answer to that is it necessary, it would happen, but you don't really see that it has to happen because you can change the attitude or change um, or do training and mentoring. Right, good answer. That was nice to have a serious question from you. Yeah. Um, hold on, here we go. He's really getting into this now. <laughs> would you fire me as a DM, and I'm going to answer this one, um, if I was riding a whale shark asking for a friend? Right. Well, Crit Hunter, I'd never employ you as a as a uh, dive master. You know, you're too crazy for it. You know, the customers would just they wouldn't dive with the other dive masters. They just want to say, "I want Justin. I want Justin." You'd lead a revolt in the dive centre. So no, I wouldn't employ you. You know, and if I did see you riding a whale shark, I'd shoot you. <laughs> He's got some questions, that boy. <laughs> Right, let's get another couple of let's get into the dive training industry now because there, there are a lot of people who really like to, like to know what the landscape's like out there. And you know, and as a, once upon a time, you know, I was a BSAC advanced instructor. I was very lucky. Um, Paddy did a, a very cost-effective changeover course with the free IE in Stony Cove in the quarry. I think it cost me two hundred pounds everything um, because you know. Um, Paddy wanted to break into the UK and uh, the BSAC instructors can't teach as they have to teach through a, a club or a BSAC school so you couldn't go and teach your friends um, and at that stage I mean, I'm talking I think 1985 or 86 no 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 later than 89 um, Paddy was the go-to agency if you wanted to be a dive professional if you didn't have a Paddy ticket you weren't getting employed Right, it was as simple as that. Dominant um, and people only. I mean, a lot of the other agencies which we know now, like SDI and a couple of others, weren't even around. But now the market's changing. Um, there's, I see agencies now like SSI, SDI, and others hungry for market share. Um, and I see instructors, 
uh, now becoming multi-agency certified, right? And, uh, and for the same level, of course, say, for example, open water, depending on which agency um, you select, you get a different price um, because of the price of materials and stuff. Um, how would you see the market developing, particularly for open water, advanced open water? Is it becoming fragmented or do you see it consolidating over time? Um, and by that, I guess I mean, do you think some of these agencies would go away? Will Paddy buy some of them? Or are we now in the new normal of at the lower levels, um, a fragmented market? Um, I'd like your thoughts. I know my thoughts on that. I mentioned earlier, I, I would follow the instructor. That's the recommendation that I give to people. But from a, a businessman, essentially mm -hmm. what you are, once you're a course director, how do you see the market now at that entry level and advanced open water level? So I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the open water instructors and some advanced instructors. No, I'm talking things. about the entry level. Yep open water divers and advanced open water divers right i'm going to come on to that next question but i'm talking, ah, you, know, okay. you you go to a you go to a, a dive shop or or to a dive instructor and i've recently had this um with someone that i'm sponsoring where there was a a menu and said well you go for this agency it's cheaper and, that, and it's at the entry level um so is it becoming fragmented i i i remember when i had my dive centers you know if you were a paddy five star you couldn't teach anything else um is that model kind of gonna um, break apart because you know everyone's chasing value for the dollar and if your materials are half price from this agency for the same standard of training and same standard of materials you know customers king who wants value for money with the overriding caveat that the instruction is good right um what are your thoughts on that well and and that's you know it's the tricky part about what's happening in the in the dive market right now is you you are seeing a, a splintering at lower levels um and you know i'm not sure uh you know all the all the fighting amongst those agencies is such a great thing for the dive industry um it used to seem like i Honestly, everybody was focused on uh, taking a bite out of Patty. And now it seems like I, I see a little bit more of some of the other agencies fighting about each other. Um, you know, uh, and as long as it's driving competition, that's always a good thing. Um, you know, if, if there was no other competitors, if, if Patty ran the whole industry, that wouldn't be good for anyone. Um, we need competition to keep us wanting to improve. But I think it just needs to be the right kind of competition. And as long as it's still the interest of basically teaching the best course possible, that's good competition and, and that, that's good. It's it's when it becomes, can we produce cheaper materials? Can we have a faster course? Can we do a program that meets, you know, a, a shorter time frame? That that's when, you know, if the interest isn't just doing the best course that you, you an agency put on, if the interest is trying to do something at a cheaper level, that's, that's when things aren't so good. And my worry is that if if people are having a poor course uh, that that reflects bad on the, the whole industry um, i know so many people who tried a resort course i'll make the little air quotations there and had a horrible experience doing it that they said oh i would never try diving again but this is someone who wanted to try it and had a bad experience with it so you know I think the right kind of competition is good and there's room for for everybody in the dive industry. It's just the wrong kind of competition with the wrong goal in mind of putting on the cheapest possible course is bad. It's bad for the industry and it's it's bad for uh, potentially new numbers. 
Yeah, I, and I just want to make one point clear to because everyone loves to paddy bash on social media, right? I was a paddy instructor. I did a lot of certifications. I was VSAC. I'm currently a PSAC and SSI instructor. And the reason, as a reason, I became an SSI instructor it wasn't really anything to do with paddy per se, or well, it was administratively. Why? Well, that's another subject. Um, you know, paddy produces as do mo all the all the mainstream. You know, if, if a dive instructor follows the paddy standards and procedures um, correctly, he will teach and produce good divers. Um, but you know, there, there's a lot of instructors out there, not just paddy, with other agencies who will take those standards. For example, um, I, I don't know paddy nowadays because I'm not active. Um, we could teach eight to one, um, but it depended on the conditions. So if it was low visibility and um, some current going, you wouldn't teach eight to one. You'd bring it down, maybe even one to one or two to one. But there's some people who read the standards who then say, right, that's I'm allowed to do that. They haven't read what Paddy and the other agencies put, you know, subject to conditions. It's like doing the, the open water dives, right? No one ever did the snorkel one. I um, would not certify some divers after four dives because I wasn't happy. Yes, they passed everything just but they weren't comfortable in the water. So I said, you've got to too much. And of course, I said, oh, you just want to take money off. I said, Did I say I was going to charge you for it? They go, what? I'm going to get two free dollars. I say, yes, because I want you to leave me and go diving. And at the moment, you're confident, even though you can do all the skills. And, and that's what Paddy said. You had to be happy with that student. It wasn't just passing the skills, right? And a lot of instructors from a lot of agencies right. do that, you know. Um, but yeah, I, I see it um, personally becoming very fragmented at that level. I, I find it amazing uh, some of the stuff going on. GUE are now doing, who, who were the elite divers, right? The, the exploration that now doing entry level scuba diving. Because, well, we don't agree with the other agencies. Well, you know, did we all learn wrong? Was the BSAC wrong? You know, is Paddy wrong? No, it's not. But yeah, there's a lot of weird stuff going out there. But I, I, I'm hoping to have one of the directors of GUE on the show and maybe we'll get some clarity on what they're up to on that one. So let's talk about the instructor. Um, and what I was really trying to get to is, is the Paddy entry level instructor model. And what I mean by that is what I mentioned earlier. You had to be, to be in the industry, you had your first professional instructor qualification, unless you came from a club background like me, had to be a Paddy Ousey. Um, is that model about to collapse? Are instructors now not considering Paddy Ousey as a rite of passage? Because that's what it was, right? It was like the first badge. You know, I've, I've, I'm in the industry, I can teach people. You know, um, are you seeing that now people are saying, well, no, I'm, I'm actually good, just going to be an SDI instructor, SSI instructor. I'm not going to bother with going the tradi traditional route, route, per se, as I saw it when I was young. What I see a little bit is, uh, you know, people, people being a little bit more loyalist to where they came from. Uh, you know, if your dive center was a... SSI dive center, then you stick with that. But I still get quite a few crossovers, uh, dive masters from other organizations and instructors from other organizations too. And, you know, to, to just answer, to just straight up answer your question, um, I don't think it's changing. Uh, you know, what I see here with all these people that come to me as dive masters from other groups uh, or other uh, professional agencies to have the most options for working in the dive industry, you still need that entry level PADI instructor card. Um, or it's not a card anymore, it's, a, it's an e-card now. Um, but you still need to be at least an entry level PADI instructor. The dive industry is very competitive, so to give yourself the best chance to find employment, that's still what you need. Um, yeah. And that, okay. Yeah, that, yeah. I don't think yeah, that's so changing still, anytime soon. It's still, now, it has got, because I was lucky, fortunate, in, in 1980, 
nine, I think it was. I did a, a crossover course. It was um, quite. It was a, I think five days, including the IE in, in Stony Cove. But I understand now, Paddy is not really interested in crossing over um, instructors. They want the instructors to go through a full IDC, or there is a kind of IOC option. But um, when I wanted to requalify as a Paddy, I wasn't given the option, even though being a, a, a still a BSAC advanced instructor, you know, um, I wasn't given the option of doing an IOC. No, you have to do. I had to do a full IDC, and. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. You know, why? I'm a staff instructor. Why can't you say, go and staff three IDCs? Why do I, at the age of 60, have to go and go like that? Um, and then SSI, um, I was talking to the SSI guy. He said, you're BSSC staff instructor. Let me check. Yeah, you, you teach to the same um, ISO standards we do. You know, you've just got to do a one-day crossover. We want to make sure you're good in the water. There's a couple of things we need to do. And because you're still current, you haven't got to do uh, written exams again, which I find pretty insulting, you know, having to go back and do, you know, essentially dive master. And um, what's your thoughts on that? Because that is going to alienate a lot of potential instructors and, and income for course directors, because course directors, you know, make money from doing IDC staff courses, right? And that sort of thing. And we're all supposed to be teaching to the same RSTC yeah. standard. So, you know, I, I can't say exactly about your experience, but, you know, there are, there are things in the PADI standards where if uh, an instructor comes to me from another agency, um, they do have, get a certain amount of credit. Uh, the requirements that they would have to fulfill basically end up being a little less than half of an IDC. Um, you know, the IDC the, as a total is, is broken into two parts. And then, so they would only have to be there for that second part. Um, I, so here with my program, what we've got is we have a, a discounted price for that, but I still encourage them to attend a full IDC just to, because the IDC um, coming in halfway through, you're gonna miss all the team building and some of the early stuff that might explain a few things. Um, you know, it's at that point, I, I'm not charging you anything more for it. It's you're just surrendering a little bit of your time to me. That's just going to give you a better experience as a, as a whole. Um, and you know, I think that as long as the, the Patty instructor card is the the gate key to the dive industry, um, they're going to maintain that you do need to do an IDC to get that because they want to make sure that the people going through it have had the level of training that, that they see as being necessary. They being no, I, I, I get that. Being I, get, I get that. Um, I absolutely get that. It's just the mechanism. You've got to essentially go and do a full IDC. Um, why don't they have... And it would be good for course directors where they say, right, course directors um, can train and certify, so you haven't got to do the IE, um, instructors that are teaching to the same standards as we are in, a, in a, say, a three or four day course, right? Because generally they're going to be older older, older instructors. They're not going to be um, in, a, in a classroom with the really young ones and that. And, it's going to, and I would see it being much more focused. I would... Yeah, I'd become a PADI instructor again if they, if they did that, right? Just to be back in. I'm still a member of PADI. I still get the undersea journal. I still get the standards and stuff. Um, but I think there's a, and you're a platinum course director, but I think PADI should actually work on, you know, how are they going to work or get instructors? Because as you said, the, the loyalty is there from other agencies into, or back into their fold or into their fold. Um, you know, I'm 63 this year. How much longer have I got? You know, every year I, I pass my diving medical, I say, oh, thank God. <laughs> anyway, that's enough of all the sort of uh, deep stuff. Let's go on to something a bit more interesting, actually, about diving and technical diving. Now, is technical diving something you're into at all in any way? Um, 
I don't know if anyone can be a little bit into technical diving, um, but I would say well, a little I mean, bit. They, I have they, taken they, they a few level tech, tech courses. Is, is kind of where I'm, I'm going. Yeah, I did. Uh, so I did a, the entry level like Tech 40 course. I did the Tech Gas Blender, and I've done my Tech Side Mount. Um, you know, I really enjoy side mount diving. Um, so I've, I've done those kinds of courses. And it's just, uh, I, I, being here in the Philippines, uh, there hasn't been that huge of a market in this area. Um, so I haven't pursued it. Being that we're mainly a recreational diving company, we don't do that much tech um, here. Now, we do have a tech instructor in our Alona branch. And he does a lot of that. There's a little more opportunity for that on Pang Lao than there is in Dowen. Um, so, you know, I never, I never did too much of it before. Um, but just as someone who, who is into teaching and into learning, I always try and take courses every year to keep myself fresh. Um, I, you know, if you're not learning, you're standing still, right? Yeah. And so I'm when, when running you... out of courses to take, so I may end up doubling back to tech um, and doing some more of that pretty soon. Okay. When you said you did the tech courses, was that as a as a diver, or are you able to teach tech rec forty side mount that sort of thing? No, I'm not a I'm not a tech instructor. I do diver level courses. Right. Okay. All right. But yeah, I can see gradually. When the opportunity arises, you'll you'll be into that. So you, you're actually going to do more qualifications as the opportunity arises, I guess. What I'm saying. Yes. Yeah, and it was that was the thing that happened. And I mean, this kind of goes back to my days in Chicago, where some of the people that were continuing on with their instructor level education, they broke into three parts, and they either went cave training, tech training, or public safety. And I went the public safety diver route. And, uh, you know, I have some good friends that went into cave diving and our training there, or tech diving and our training there. Um, and I guess like in I many now, ways. Here, I don't have as much opportunity for that. Yeah, and I guess in many ways, but public safety diving, when you really think about it, when it's real public safety diving and not I've just got the card, you know, looking for bodies, recovering vehicles, that sort of stuff is in many ways an extension of tech diving even though it's shallow it is hazardous it is life-threatening um it does take you out of your comfort zone so i guess um all that experience in public safety diving would make you an ideal um, candidate to be a top tech instructor yeah and i mean that may eventually be where i'm headed next um you know like i said i, I love to keep keep learning and uh, uh, you know that that is probably the next logical extension here is to start moving through the tech courses and you know eventually uh, start training it if I am enjoying it as much as I would think I will um, you know the, to want to start training that too okay right just before we go on to a bit more on, on tech let's just see what's come up oh it's critter hunt the critter hunt I'm going to rename this the Critter Hunter show, I think. Let's talk Critter Hunter. Um, <laughs> right, he's gone back to the whale shark. What if me and the whale shark were good friends? Critter Hunter. Um, that's my impression of his channel. Um, Critter Hunter, you haven't got any good friends, so sorry about that, mate. Um, Brian, how did you find someone with almost same same hair color as you? Uh, well, I've actually let the hair go great. I've got to, I'm going to reveal hey, my dirty That's little, just the sun. I'm going to reveal my dirty little secret. You know, normally I dye my hair. I have it dyed blonde and that, but I've kind of let it all hey. go out. And this is my natural um, old man. But now he's brought that up. Um, when I come back from the mall dives, I'm going to go and get it blonded again. Um, what else has he got? We need a critter finding yeah. specialty to create the best searches. Yeah, that critter spot, yeah, that would be. Ah, this is not on my script, but it's something I'm very passionate about. 
Um, a lot of um, I, I see it happening a little bit, but you know, is there any sort of a um, big push really? Um, and I think these um, should be not for profit type courses. I think people like Paddy and the other agencies um, should be offering um, that cost. I mean, not, not free um, awareness courses on how to dive with certain critters. Um, and what's got me into this and made me passionate about this is uh, people who watch my channel will know about me and the seahorses and the seahorse trust. I've had the seahorse whisperer on the show. Um, Roger Hansen from California. And everyone loves to dive with a seahorse, right? Everyone loves to dive with a seahorse. But you can actually kill a seahorse inadvertently and not know you've done it. Um, and that's the same. And how that happens is they, uh, and the, the research is, there's a bit of debate on the research, but uh, what I'm going to say now is pretty, is pretty well backed up by the Seahorse Trust. If, if you put big bright lights on them or if you um, stress them, that's when they go dark, the head goes down. Um, they have latent diseases and that stress can trigger those diseases. So although the seahorse doesn't die there and then, it can get sick and die. Um, but there's nothing about that in any of the agencies. And when I was talking to the um, executive director of the Seahorse Trust, he said, Paddy, I said, all these, they're not interested. I've spoke to them and they're not interested. Do you not think it would be a good idea for all the agencies to get together and develop a course, you know, diving with species? So some of the, the, the common things like um, not riding the whale trout. Okay, that's, but you, that just comes from the instructor. But where all the common stuff, that all the stuff people want to see, how to behave in the water with them. Do you not think that would be a good uh, not-for-profit specialty, multi-agency, right? So it'd be called the Project Aware Plus um, Behavioural Divers Certification. I think, I definitely think that that kind of knowledge is is just as critical as, uh, you know, how to, how to maintain neutral buoyancy. But I, I think why the agencies aren't getting more involved in it is because of the tremendously varied environments that people are diving in. Um, you know, if you're from the Midwestern part of the States and just going to a few spots in the Caribbean, you may never see a seahorse. So yeah, I'm not, I'm not, not talking just about not a ton of, I uh, just use that as an example. Right, right. I know not, not, but I mean, in that case though, then to cover all these different environments, you would need a course with a textbook um, thicker than an old phone book. So I yeah. think, you know, I think what they're doing is trying to leave it up to the up to the professionals. And I mean, at least what I'm doing here, because Dowen is but a very professional don't know is every dive and, and that's, I speak to that, that's about too sea bad. horses does not know. They could kill them just by stressing them. The level of education is not there at the instructor level. I'm sorry. Um, it might be with Klaus, the marine biologist you've got oh. res resident, but the average instructor. Uh, and when I'm on the dive boats, I've, I've been diving on Fridays. I don't like diving Fridays because it's very busy, but I've been wanting to go to some new sites. And people have said, wow, we didn't know that. We won't do it again. You know, I haven't been criticizing. They said, oh, it was one instance a couple of weeks ago. They said, you didn't photograph the seahorses. You're here to do that. I said, I know. But they were stressed because of all the attention. And they, everyone, without hesitation on the boat, said, we didn't know that, Brian. Thanks for telling us. And I'm, and I'm trying now to make some posters and stickers that we can put on the, on the boats. But the, the knowledge isn't there, right? Maybe it should be done as part of an IDC, you know, an afternoon um, spent on the most common critters people want, want to see, right? And how to dive with them because it's not there. Well, and I mean, for for the particular environment we're in, you know, people that that stay with us and do diving internships and instructing internships, they learn a lot about the environment and things like that. 
Um, you know, I, we do see some occasional marine life up here also. Um, you know, so we even have uh, one of our uh, dive masters, and uh, she's going to be an instructor soon. Um, she is a marine biology student here at Silliman. She gives talks to the guests about proper whale shark interaction, proper sea turtle interaction, things like that. So, I mean, uh, you know, here for, for CX, we do these kinds of things. Um, we always tell people if, uh, if they're going somewhere where there are pygmy seahorses, um, you're going to try and film using white balance slates and ambient lighting. Um, you know, keep, if you're using strobes, keep them turned down, keep them to a minimum, no more than three, uh, things like that. You know I mean? So we do, there are some of us that know these things and try and educate our guests about them. Um, you know, uh, yeah, and it, no, but it's cool. I mean, I, and, and, and people, you know, people are not having a go at, at the explorers. They are top of their game. They are well known. Just follow Critter Hunter, and you'll see how professional they are. And, and they are. But you know, my comments weren't addressed at Tim. They weren't an attack. It was about the system in general. Um, but do me a favour. Um, try and get the photographers right. not to use any light at all on the seahorses. Um, um, if you go to the seahorsetrust.org, they've got a very good diver's guide on there, um, mm -hmm. which I would suggest that um, maybe all your instructors should should have a, a, a read of. That's my little seahorse rant over with. <laughs> all right, let's get back on with the show instead of me going off at tangents. Um, now, I personally see the future in, in diving. Um, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, being in rebreathers eventually. Whether that's in my diving lifetime or not, I don't know. Um, but I, whether it's simple semi-closed units that um, replace the current traditional you know, tank, octopus and regulator, or fully automated units. Um, if David Street's still on, he might have some views on that. Um, I actually see sometime, probably in your lifetime, maybe not in my lifetime, that we'll just be diving rebreathers. Um, what, do, what are your thoughts on rebreathers? And what's the paddy current view on rebreathers? I did see something about the KISS rebreather in, in the latest Undersea Journal, but I didn't read it, read and study it. Um, so what do you think? I think eventually yeah that's that's the way the industry will go um with rebreathers but i think we're a long ways off um you know i think it's going to have to be um an almost almost like bulletproof setup just like uh, an open circuit unit is now um, whereas you remove 99 percent of the margin for error just with a very simple five minute check uh, before that becomes the standard of the industry. They're not there yet. I know they're working towards it. But once once that happens, uh, once you know some of the margin for error is removed, uh, I, I definitely think it makes a lot more sense than, than open circuit. So yeah, I, I agree that that's probably where the industry is headed. I just think there's still still some things that need to happen first. The simplicity of the open circuit standard Scooby units that we use needs to be replicated as far as how you can set it up and check it. Um, yeah, I'd agree with, with that. I'd agree with that. With hours and hours of training. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, things like you know, um, instead of filling your own scrubber canister, that you actually just got one that you put in, and there's an automatic. Um, indicator which says you know change it now you know um, but good I'm glad we're on the same what's it, Paddy's sort of view or future view on rebreathers you're, I mean you're a course director you'll know more than I learn from reading undersea journal and stuff um, what's you know what's Paddy sort of where are they where what's their stance at the moment on rebreathers 
in support of them. Um, you know, they understand that it's a, a big investment. So if someone has, has invested in a rebreather and taken the time to train on it, so if they're properly qualified on that rebreather, they can use it for any course uh, that doesn't, as long as they can meet the course standards. So oh, as right. long as the being on the rebreather doesn't, uh, the, the standards of the course, they can use it during, during a course. Um, and then they've, they've really adapted with some of the, the tech rebreather training that uh, they're, you're using all these different kinds of rebreathers or different brands. Each one is its own training module uh, where you're getting trained on that unit and that's the one you're using rather than just a standardized rebreather course that might, may or may not apply to the unit you have. Yeah, so I, I think they've gone that way. But again, I think you know the fact that you need for different courses for different brands of rebreathers is is going to make it take a little bit longer before they can find their way to the mainstream. Yeah, I agree with that completely. Um, have you done any rebreather diving at all, or still waiting? I did. I did want a, like a tech tryout day, um, and I I would have liked it, but I must admit I I did miss how quickly I could set up and check my open circuit units. Um, yeah. Uh, that uh, you know that that uh, doing that quickly and, uh, and and getting right to the dive is very nice, uh, but. You know, for sure, the benefits uh, of getting closer to the marine life and uh, you know, some of the extra safety benefits about how how long your air supply can last and things like that. It's uh, it, they're really great for that. Yeah, well, you never know. Um, uh, David Street has been a buddy of mine for what nearly forty years. You know, um, who's developed the Proteus Rodrigo. You never know; we may get him to come over to the Philippines and do a little session at Sea Explorers. You know, he's, he's keen to get the unit out there. So I'll see if we can twist his arm. Um, he can Fantastic. teach us both. <laughs> David, I hope you're still watching. Probably not. He, he's a workaholic. He comes in and out of the stream while he's at work. Um, so we've got rebreathers done. Well, yeah, that's yeah, we're at the last question, Tim. Yeah, we've been going at this nearly an hour and a half. So, I mean, it's obvious to anyone who sees you. Well, all right. Good anyone who sees you with Finn Snow, I'm a big name dropper, as you can see, and your own channel, uh, Sea Explorers, on um, that you are really happy at, at, at Sea Explorers and you've been there seven years, you, you're well settled. Have you got any future plans? And if you have, what are they? You know, right now, the the immediate future plan is just to get people back into the Philippines. You know, hopefully soon will be the world will be open back up. Um, you know, in without the international tourism, we're looking a lot more towards our local market. But as far as like long range future plans, um, you know, just to continue to turn out not just the best divers but the best dive instructors that I can. Uh, you know, I, I'm by no means done striving towards, uh, towards career goals, but I'm very, very happy with where I am um, as far as, you know, the, the location that I'm in and what I've accomplished so far. And now it's just basically expanding on what I've accomplished. Um, you know, teach, uh, teach more people how to be great dive instructors. Uh, show more people uh, about the beauty and wonder of the underwater world on the YouTube channel. Uh, just, just get it out there to more people and just expand. Right. Now, one last question. Where would you like to dive where you haven't dived already in the world? What's top of your diving bucket list? Um, you know, I know a lot of uh, you'll hear a lot uh, with Critter right now and Finn out there, their Critter bucket list and things like that. Um, uh, there, I haven't seen everything, 
but there is one main one that escapes me, and I like to dive where I could see uh, a great white, a great white shark. I absolutely right, so love sharks. It's one of my favorite animals, and I've been very fortunate to be aware with almost all different types of them, but I have never seen a great white, and I would desperately like to. Right, cool, great, great answer, great answer on that one. Great white sharks, that's what he wants to do, boys and girls. Um, and I'll, I'll come with you on that one because I've not seen one either. Um, Tim, brilliant, thank you. Oh, fantastic. Um, I know, you, even though in, in the pandemic going on, I know you are still quite busy um, at Sea Explorer, so I'd like to thank you for taking nearly an hour and a half out of your day, uh, the, the prime time, the end of the day when you've got to get all things sorted out. Um, really good uh, insights you've given oh, us. Thanks for having me, Paddy. Brian. Good insights on Paddy and, and and really, yeah, I think we agreed that you, you've still got to become a Paddy Housey if you want to succeed, right? So that's it. You know, say what you like about Paddy people. It's number one. You've got to be an Housey if you want to travel the world. Um, if you want to get hold of Tim, there's a links in the description below already to Pura Vida and, and Sea Explorers. Um, and I think your email address is gopro at seaexplorers.com, is it? That's the one. Right, so you know, if you want, I would recommend, you know, I, I've not met Tim personally, but I've interacted with him. I've seen, um, particularly on Finn Snow and Critter Hunters channel, where they've been um, diving out of Pura, Pura Vida and with Sea Explorers. You just go on those videos and you can see the level of professionalism. Um, so me sitting here in Dubai at the start of summer, I would have no hesitation in recommending Tim and his team for doing a dive pro training or just to go diving. You know, you can see the quality of their operation easily on, on YouTube. Well, I'm off to the Maldives tomorrow night um, for a couple of weeks. So when I oh, get fantastic. back... Enjoy. We've got some interesting people. I think um, one of the guys I'm going to talk to is probably the youngest scuba tuber out there. I haven't found anyone younger. He's in the States. He's quite keen um, to be interviewed, and I'm going to love it because he, he's really uh, an ambitious, enthusiastic young man. So if you want to see some more of these live streams, um, the feed wasn't brilliant today, but we did kind of adjust um, to match with the Wi-Fi. So... Um, hit the subscribe button, please. Do share this because I'm getting more and more interesting people on the show. And hopefully, we may even get the owner of Sea Explorers and Pura Vida on the show one day. Um, hint, hint, nudge, nudge, as they say. So I'm sure um, Tim will have a chat with him. So, people, we are officially off air. I'll see what I can do.